welcome back to this series of tutorials by FlingOS. In this tutorial, we will be looking at interrupts. This will include an understanding of what interrupts are, what they can be used for, and a particular example of using the timer interrupt. We will also look at the way interrupts are handled on the x86 architecture. In the previous tutorial, we looked at virtual memory and how to set up paging and create a higher half kernel. I will be assuming from now on that the kernel is a higher half kernel, though you can choose not to use that design if you so wish. The code should be relatively simple to adapt. Let's take a moment to understand what interrupts are. An interrupt is a hardware signal, triggered by anything from the keyboard to the onboard timer to a divide by zero condition detected by the processor. In the simplest case, when an interrupt signal is received by the processor, the processor pauses the current execution and jumps to a handler method for the interrupt. When the interrupt handler returns, the processor, ideally, resumes what it was previously executing. Interrupts are the only true form of asynchronous programming we can do on a single core. Interrupts cover everything from exceptions to delayed processing traps to peripheral signals such as a USB device, a mouse or a keyboard, and of course core features such as the timer which enables scheduling of processes and threads. As has been mentioned, there are three types of interrupt. It is important to understand these. The types are exceptions. These can be known as interrupts, interrupt gates, exceptions, and probably some other names that I can't think of. Essentially, an exception is a hardware-generated interrupt that corresponds to a specific condition being met, whereby the state of the hardware is invalid, such that it cannot proceed. For instance, a divide by zero exception is an exception generated by the processor because it can't continue executing. An exception interrupt usually pushes information about the exception onto the stack. All exception interrupts are generated by the CPU. Traps. These can also be known as interrupts, but are also called interrupt traps, trap gates, or similar. In all respects, they are the same as exceptions, apart from the fact that traps may not leave any information on the stack. In a sense, exceptions are a subset of traps. Gates. These are often known as task gates. They are something special. A task gate causes the hardware to perform a task switch before the interrupt is handled. There are many debates over whether task gates should or shouldn't be used. Some of those arguments focus on speed, others on energy efficiency. For now though, RS is so basic that we don't need task gates because we only have one process, i.e. only one task. Ok, so now we know what interrupts are, let's look at how we can configure interrupts on the x86 processor. The x86 processor uses something called the interrupt descriptors table. As the name suggests, the IDT is a table of entries, each of which tells the processor what to do for each interrupt. Interrupts each have specific numbers. Interrupts 0 to 31 inclusive have special meanings on the x86 processor. Interrupt 0, for example, is the divide by 0 interrupt. The processor works out which row of the table corresponds to which interrupt number, often called an interrupt vector, by taking the zero based index of the row in the table. Each row has a specific format, as shown here. As with the GDT, the IDT is a table in memory. Just the same as with the GDT, the processor uses a special pointer to the IDT, which has two bytes of additional information. Code creating and loading a pointer to the IDT is shown here. Go ahead and write some code for creating a handler entry in row 0. You'll need to create an exception interrupt entry with a pointer to an exception interrupt handler. This means you'll need to create an interrupt handler function, give it a name like interrupt zero handler, or something similar. Here's the sample code. Now that we have one set up, the rest are fairly simple, with only a few variations on the same theme. The complete annotated sample can be found in the repository. A link is in the description. Note that there are a few new bits of assembly code here that you won't have seen before. The annotations explain the use of macros. For detail on macros and symbols in assembly code, 
please see the NASM documentation available through its website. You'll notice that the sample code provided has only empty methods for the various interrupt handlers. This is because we don't yet know how to handle the various types of exception or interrupt. On the x86, there are three main types of handling you have to know about. Exception handling. This is when the processor reaches a point where it can't continue executing without help of some kind. Some exceptions require you to entirely change the state of execution that will be returned to, such as a divide by zero exception. Others only require you to modify the state slightly, if at all, before returning, such as a page fault. In our simple code, we will not have proper handlers for any of the exceptions. We will just be outputting messages to say they happened, and then attempt to return execution to where it was. Unfortunately, this will mean that if an exception does occur, it will probably only result in further exceptions, and eventually a processor reset. The second type is standard interrupt service routines. This is for traps which have no specific meaning associated with them. We, the programmers, can assign whatever meaning we like to them. For example, ISR128 is often used for system calls. The third and final type is for interrupts from the programmable interrupt controller, usually referred to as the PIC. These interrupts come from peripherals such as hard disks, keyboards, and USB. Some of them are strictly reserved for one type of device, for example timers. Other interrupt vectors are shared between multiple devices and multiple types of device. For these interrupts, each device which could potentially have caused the interrupt must be checked until one reports that it caused the interrupt. We will discuss the PIC and peripheral devices in more detail in a minute. So for handling exceptions, we will do one simple piece of processing, outputting a colour to the screen. We already know how to do this, so you should be able to go ahead and write the code for that yourself. There is one final thing you must note that applies to all types of interrupt handling. They must end with an IRET instruction, not a normal return instruction. IRET stands for interrupt return. This is necessary because an ISR is not a typical method. It is not called by a standard call instruction, so it has a special return instruction as well. We discussed briefly earlier the Programmable Interrupt Controller, or PIC, or PIC for short. The PIC is a piece of hardware which sits between the processor and hardware peripherals such as keyboards, timers, mice, and hard disks. When a peripheral wants to notify the processor about something, for example that a key has been pressed, it pulses the input line attached to the PIC. The PIC can accept multiple interrupts from peripherals at once. It will queue interrupts and send them to the processor in an order defined by a priority system. Since the PIC is accepting interrupts and passing them on, interrupts received from the PIC are known as IRQs instead of ISRs. That is, they are interrupt requests instead of interrupt services. This is because you can just ignore IRQs if you so wish. Ignoring some IRQs may result in a device failing, but your OS will still run. Also, because the PIC is passing on interrupts, IRQs are numbered from 0 to 15, since there are only 16 interrupt lines to the PIC. The IRQs are mapped to ISR numbers in two equal chunks, the first eight interrupts and the second eight. They are mapped to non-contiguous groups of eight ISRs. The reason the IRQs can be mapped in two independent groups of eight is because the PIC is not one piece of hardware. In fact, there are two PICs, each of which can handle eight interrupts. One is called the master PIC, and the other is the slave PIC. This will become significant later when we look at how to handle an IRQ from a PIC. First, let's look at how we enable interrupts from the PIC and how we configure the mapping. IRQs can be enabled and disabled individually. A disabled IRQ simply isn't passed to the processor if it is received, so from our perspective it never occurs. So to enable IRQs we enable each one that we want to handle individually. The PIC is configured using registers which are at the other end of I.O. ports. Remember those things we discussed way back in the first couple of tutorials. So to set values in the PIC registers, we send the PIC a command, which tells it which register to set, and some data, 
which tells it what to set the register to. Here is the sample code for remapping the PIC, followed by sample code for enabling and disabling particular IRQs. For RRS, we only want to enable the timer and keyboard IRQs, which are IRQs 0 and 1. Finally, we must look at how to handle these two particular IRQs. For now, we will do our usual thing of just outputting something to the screen when the interrupts occur. However, the timer interrupt is likely to occur very frequently, so we don't want to output a colour every time. Instead, we will just invert the colour of a single character on the screen. Here is the code for the timer and keyboard handlers. The final thing we must look at is how to return from an IRQ. The pick queues interrupts and won't send the next one unless it is of a higher priority than the last one which was sent, or it knows the previous one has finished, i.e. the OS reports that it has stopped handling it. This means that when we finish handling an IRQ, we must inform the pick of that fact before returning from the interrupt handler, i.e. before the IRET instruction. Again, this involves sending the PIC a command, however, I mentioned earlier that the PIC is actually two PICs, one master and one slave. If the IRQ came from the master PIC, we only need to inform the master PIC of the end of interrupt. However, if the IRQ came from the slave, we have to inform both the master and the slave PICs that we have finished processing. Here is the code to do just that. This is the last bit of this tutorial, and a final small bit of information you need to know before we move on. The x86 has a special halt instruction, which stops the processor from executing. It literally just stops it. The processor halts and goes to sleep. At this point, there is only one thing which can reawaken the processor. You guessed it, it's interrupts. If an interrupt such as the timer interrupt occurs, while the processor is halted, the processor reawakens. Initially, it handles the interrupt, but the ISR handler will have no way of telling, without a software variable, of whether the processor was previously halted or not. As a result, after the IRET, the processor will continue executing after the point where it was previously halted. There are two things we can do about this. One is to disable interrupts prior to halting. The x86 doesn't allow us to disable all interrupts, but a single instruction can be used to disable or enable all PIC interrupts, without affecting the configuration of which individual IRQs were enabled or disabled. This will avoid reawakening by device interrupts such as ones from the timer or keyboard, but not by a CPU fault or non-maskable interrupt, which can still occur for various reasons while the processor is halted. The second thing we can do is put the processor into an infinite loop, which just continuously calls the halt instruction, so if the processor is woken, it immediately halts again. Of course, there are uses for the halt instruction, which don't demand an infinite halt state. For instance, you may deliberately use the halt instruction with interrupts enabled, if you wish to wait for an interrupt to occur. The halt instruction will be more efficient than an infinite loop for two reasons. One is that a loop would have to continuously poll to see if an interrupt occurred, and the second is that the loop keeps the processor busy, the halt instruction doesn't. The halt instruction is better for efficiency in all aspects. Here is some sample code for creating an infinite halting state. You might recognise it because it's been part of the code from the very outset. There is lots more to learn about interrupts, but you will pick it up along the way. For now, you have a good enough understanding to be able to use them. In the next tutorial, we will be covering video output in more detail. We will look at our existing output code to better understand how it works and how we can extend it to output text.